yeah, so I'm Mark Sugiyama. Uh, I am currently a, a senior principal Erlang engineer uh, at Baxter. Uh, so I'm actually working with Brujo and Victor and some other people uh, who are here. Uh, and my talk is about how I really grew to appreciate uh, Erlang type specs. So I'll just uh, jump, jump right in. So this journey for me, uh, or I should start, for, first start by saying that, you know, uh, I always found that type specs were kind of inconvenient, right? Because there's a lot of repeated information and it just seemed unnecessary. But this journey for me started with a, a project I worked on uh, at a couple companies ago that was a really complicated refactoring. Um, and it had to do with a state machine that sat between a, uh, a database engine uh, and a database client. And there was this um, unfortunate syncopation of how the data was being moved, which required you know, the state machine to represent what was happening on the client side, but then some other kind of statefulness for how to manage what was happening on the server side. Um, and you know, the code was, you know, was extraordinarily confusing. Um, there was no real design to it and nothing was written down. There was no documentation. There were almost no comments in the code, and the comments that were there were, not, were actually kind of misleading. And among the problems were, th were things like this. Um, you know, there was a, uh, a set of functions called something like set attribute, get type, get property, uh, and they were all actually operating on the same thing. Um, and so every time I was, as I was looking at the code, I'd say, okay, wait, what's the difference between a property and an attribute? And then have to go look at the implementations and realize, oh, wait, no, they're the same thing. Uh, and this just added to the cognitive load of trying to understand what was already very complicated and confusing code. Uh, and then there were these things that were kind of misleading. Uh, there would be functions that said they would be getting something, but they would not only get it, but then they were also changing the state of something else that was kind of only tangentially related um, that affected the behavior. And so that was also kind of confusing, right? Because you, you, you don't expect a function that gets something to actually be modifying the state of the system. So as I was working on this, I was trying to think about, or I started to think about, what would have made it easier to understand uh, you know, what I was supposed to do, how this worked. Um, and uh, maybe to, to illustrate this, I want to just go through kind of a contrived example. So I'm sure we've all kind of looked at code that we wrote many years ago or written by somebody else, right? And you run, you, you're in the function, you kind of trip over something that looks something like this, right? It's like, okay, it's a function called user send, and it's got these two kind of meaningless arguments. And it's like, well, what is this doing? Is it sending user information? Is it sending a message? You know, we can't really tell just by looking at that one line. Without the context around it, it's very hard to understand what's just happened here. Um, so we can get maybe get a hint by uh, looking at the um, the function head, where the function is defined. And there we say, okay, so now, now it's a little bit clearer, right? Now we know that the first argument is, is a user and the second argument is a message. But what types are these? Is, it, is the user a user ID? Is it some sort of record or a map? Uh, and what is the message? Is it a list? Is it an IO list? Uh, you know, so forth. So we can basically reverse engineer that function and discover that, uh, okay, the message argument is used as a binary, so it has to be a binary. So we can give ourselves a little hint, maybe by renaming the argument, to say, okay, this is a bin, right? This is, this is a binary. Um, and we could maybe do the same thing with user and slowly discover, maybe not in this function, but functions that it calls, that it's in fact a user ID uh, and that uh, maybe it's an integer, right? So we can give ourselves a little bit of, we can go a little bit better than just renaming the argument by providing uh, a type spec for that function, right? And so we can say, okay, the first argument is an integer, uh, the second argument is a bin, is a binary, sorry, and um, we also get the benefit of trying to understand what it's returning, right? So maybe in this case it returns okay and an error in some sort of error, error tuple. So, you know, type specs are kind of interesting. They, uh, there is a whole language of type specs, and just to, to sort of touch the surface of it, uh, there are defined types for the, uh, the basic Erlang data types, like atoms and lists and maps. 
Uh, and then uh, the type language, the type spec language, also includes sort of derived types um, that are based on basically common usage or idioms, right? So there's a, ty a, a type spec type called a Boolean, which is either the atom true or false, uh, or maybe non-negative integer, right? It's, a, it's an integer with a range associated with it. Uh, and then there are also some like module, which, you know, module names are atoms, right? But, um, and this now gives a hint of where we're headed, right? You can, um, th there are some of the derived types which provide a little bit more semantic information. Right? An atom would be, you could say it's an atom, but by saying it's a module, then at that point you know, okay, this, this is supposed to represent a module. Um, you can also define you know, things of, uh, of lists and tuples and so forth. But, but basically using the basic types, you're getting information about what it is you know, in the sense of uh, syntactically maybe of what it is. Um, and uh, this is great for, and there have been a number of talks here about using type specs for correctness, right? And this is, I think, very, this is sufficient for correctness, right? But is it, I, I was finding that it's not really sufficient if you're trying to document the code, right? And what's more useful is if we start defining types uh, that are based on sort of what the semantic of that value is. Right? So, for example, we can say that a user ID is a non-negative integer and a message is a binary. And then if we, def if we use those in the type specs, now we know, okay, it's not just a non-negative integer, right? It's, it's a user ID. Um, and, uh, and even, you know, in this example, maybe uh, like mess uh, defining message as a binary, maybe that's not quite sufficient, right? Maybe, maybe we need to know the encoding. Is it a Latin one string? Is it a UTF-8 string? You know, things like that. So we can get more and more specific, and as we do that, I think we get a better understanding of what the function is doing uh, without having to read the function. Right? So if we don't have to keep reverse engineering things, that makes us you know, much more productive. We can just look at the type spec, look at the function head, and understand what's supposed to happen. I mean, that's a big, uh, big gain, I think. The other thing is that if we do this type specking, type specking consistently, then we, can say, then we can start to see where the values are coming from. Right? So I know that the function requires a use ID, but what gives me that user ID, right? So maybe there's a, a login function that if we just specified, you know, uh, by the types, we could say, well, it just returns a tuple, right? But that's not very useful, right? In, in the sense of it's, it's correct, right? And for correctness, it's, that's pretty good. We might have even been a little more specific and say it's a tuple of two elements. But if we say that the login returns a user ID, then we can say, oh, that's where the user ID comes from. So I know if I call the login function, I get something that's a user ID, I can pass it to any other function that says that it takes a user ID. I don't have to reverse engineer everything to make sure that that's, in fact, the right kind of value, right? Because, you know, I'm sure we've all seen code where something says it's a user, but we don't know if it's the username or the user ID or, a, you know, a record or something, right? So this just makes it much, much easier and, and helps reduce the cognitive load the mental load of understanding what's happening, what the code is doing. Um, so for this uh, project of uh, this refactor, um, I, uh, I kind of took this one step further. So just to talk a little bit more about this, uh, what I was working on. So it was a gen statum that uh, kind of sat in the middle. So on the one side, it was interacting with a, uh, a a database, a SQL database, um, where we had many layers of code that that would uh, that we needed to pull uh, data from. So we would say, "Okay, give me the next batch of data," and that next batch of data might include data rows or some metadata about what the following rows were going to look like. Uh, and it was. Uh, it was it was all size based, so you might get the tail end of the previous you know set of rows, and then the metadata for the next set of rows, and then the beginning of that set. On the other side, uh, we were using uh, we were emulating Postgres, so we had a, a version of the PGV3 protocol. So the gen statum aligned with the client protocol, but there's now this syncopation, right? So we're sending data to the um, 
to the Postgres side and remembering what state we were in for that protocol. But then at the same time, we needed to remember where we were in reading the data from, from the other side. The old, the original code used a map to, so, so to remember the state of the server side, the original code used a map uh, and, and then a bunch of heuristics about with the keys. So it's say, like, oh, well, if it has this key in it, I must have just read the meta metadata. And if it has this other key in it, then I must be in the middle of you know, a multi-set result. Uh, but if it doesn't have this key in it, I must be done with this part of it. And you can imagine how confusing that was, right? So what I, um, as I realized how confusing it was, uh, what I decided to do is I created a record to represent all the different states on the server side that then got passed into all the, cl fun the client functions. And so the client function then could look at, figure out, you know, based on the record, what it should be doing, how it should be interacting with the server side. Uh, and this had the advantage of making it much clearer about what was happening. Uh, and then also, um, I got very clear runtime errors, right? So when I run a test, uh, if I got a, you know, um, a function clause error b from the client side uh, because I didn't implement one of the, the, the record types, then I said, oh, okay, I, I'm not taking care of this case, right? So then I can add the code for that case. Um, and that, that just helped tremendously. It made, it made this uh, much easier to, um, to understand what I was doing. Uh, and in the process of doing this, I discovered that uh, someone had papered over a bug. So it turned out that depending on the kind of backend database it was talking to, it would sometimes not send some of the uh, metadata. And so buried in all of this code was something that was th synthesizing the missing metadata and just kind of injecting it into the results that were coming back from the server. And, and that was just not obvious at all um, that, that that had happened. Um, so as far as defining uh, type specs, uh, you know, you can define type specs for records. Um, and it turns out there's a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, you, you, know, you can define the record uh, with the types in it, like as in this example, and then define a type around the record. Um, but this runs, you run into problems with this uh, with Dialyzer. Uh, if you, say, use the record for a... Um, a match spec, say like for ETS, where you use the the atom, the underlying atom to represent any value in the match spec, uh, or maybe sometimes in the process of constructing the record, uh, some of the fields are undefined, but that's not really kind of the the main purpose, right? Usually, by the time it comes out of a function, it's got a value. Um, so then you end up kind of decorating your uh, to make Dialyzer happy, you kind of end up decorating your record this way. Uh, I'm told, uh, although I haven't actually tried this, um, that uh, if you instead define the types within the uh, type definition, that this keeps, is this right, Brujo? Yeah. So this keeps Dialyzer happy about these slight inconsistencies, but still provides the documentation and, and still you know, keeps things, uh, you know, keeps, keeps Dialyzer happy. <laughs> yeah. You, if you say you return some of that, whatever you do before returning, it yeah. doesn't matter. So you can have undefined. Gotcha. Okay. So what Brujo is saying is that um, what it is is that uh, uh, you can have whatever you want until you return the value. And then once the value is returned, it, it's expected to be this way. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Um, so uh, this is something that uh, we, we've been trying to do with the current project, that, that the Baxter project that uh, Brujo and I and Piotr and other people are working on, although we're running into other problems um, because of the way that we process records, which we won't go into, but please ask us about it if you're curious. Um, you can also provide uh, a very specific typing for, um, uh, for, for maps. Um, and this is kind of nice because you can uh, specify exactly what all the keys are, right? And so this is a great way of documenting uh, what the contents of the map should be. And Dialyzer is actually pretty good at saying, yeah, no, 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 this key isn't in here, um, so there's something wrong, right? Uh, and and we, we, we use this to great effect at datometry uh, on, on certain data structures. So the... Um, uh, the main point I'm trying to make here is that 
we, if, if the code is clear, it makes, it, it makes us as engineers much more productive, right? We understand what we're going to do. So we can make changes with much more confidence, right? We, can, we don't have to keep second guessing ourselves about what does this function really do? do we, how do we, and, and, and to do that, right, you have to reverse engineer it. And that's no fun, right? Why should we go back and reread stuff that somebody else has written or we wrote 10 years ago and don't remember? Um, and by providing that clarity, it reduces the cognitive load, right? It reduces the mental load and of understanding kind of what the foundational work is so that you can actually do, you have the space in your head to do what it is you're actually trying to accomplish, right? So key takeaways here uh, is uh, I think we should, as much as we can, strive for clarity in the code and the comments, right? And and, to th and really, if you do that, I mean, how many times have you looked at code and said, who wrote this? Why, why is it this way, right? <laughs> that, that person is like, you know, I'm going to wring his neck, right? So if you do it right, you know, other people won't be cursing at you. Uh, and even maybe it's yourself, right? I mean, how often have you looked at code that you wrote five years ago or even a year ago? And it's like, what the heck was I thinking? Right? What, what is this? Right? So if you, you know, uh, as you figure stuff out, you know, I think we all take notes when we're looking at code. Um, put those notes in the code, right? If there's something that's surprising, just put a comment in there so that the next person doesn't have to figure it out again, right? And if that had been done for you, can you imagine how much faster or how much more productive and, and, and uh, confident you would feel about the work that you're doing? And that's all. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for one question. Yes. Oops. Hi. Um, hello. So thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. I also share your love for, uh, for this kind of stuff. Uh, but I'm going to play the divorce advocate. Sure. Uh, so I get this in the context of a dynamic language, but don't you think this is really just a, a poor way of trying to get some typing information out of the code? Yeah, well, you could argue that for uh, even the correctness aspect, right? Do we, do we really need, you know, you could argue that for, uh, you know, it's just an integer right, rather than is it a user ID. I think that um, even if we, you know, are kind of reluctant to do the type specs, uh, even just documenting the fact that yes, this is this value is a user ID, providing some semantic around the value, and whether you do that with a type spec like I've shown here, or do it by naming the variables in a consistent way, uh, I don't think you know either way. You, you're still conveying the same information. Really, it's about are you communicating? Are you is the code telling the story that you can understand? Right. All right. Thank you very much. And. <laughs> Thank you.